Last fall, the Lord announced through his prophets that the church would hold family home evening on Monday night. About the same time, uh, the other side announced that there'd be a professional football game on Monday night. <laughs> you might be surprised how many families tried to work family home evening in between halftime of the football game. <laughs> of course, it can't be done. In the fourth section of the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord sets forth the qualifications for the labors of the ministry. And he says that they are faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God. Now the faith, hope, charity, and love, we know something about. They're very important. But the eye single to the glory of God is probably the most important of those qualifications. Generally speaking, an eye single to the glory of God means sacrifice. It means that instead of endlessly doing what we want to do, we have to do what the Lord wants us to do. We have to do it, of course, in his way when he wants us to do it. This is, of course, not a natural inclination of man. We hear much in the world today about doing our own thing. I doubt that this is really new, however. I think it's probably been going on since the beginning of time. Perhaps it's just a little different way of saying it. Cain did his own thing, contrary to the will of the Lord. And, uh, of course, Lucifer did his own thing, directly contrary to the plan of his father. These following this direction, of course, has never been very profitable. Certainly not in terms of happiness, and this is really the reason that we're here, to be happy. The prophet Lehi's statement that man is, that he might have joy, is an all-inclusive statement. On the other hand, Abraham was told by God to sacrifice his only son Isaac as a burnt offering to the Lord. I presume that Abraham could not have received a more disagreeable commandment from his heavenly father. Still, he arose immediately, gathered up the necessary firewood, and took his son and started to the designated spot. And he couldn't be diverted from that course until an angel of the Lord actually intervened and stayed his hand. What was the reward for Abraham's action? Hear the Lord's statement to Abraham. Because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars in the heavens and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Jesus, our Lord and Master, was the greatest example of all of his of following in obedience to his Father's commandment. His great agony in the Garden of Eden I presume, or the Garden of Gethsemane, I presume uh, has never been approached and cannot be matched by human man. He prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. The Master didn't want to endure what was before him, even though he knew that it was the major purpose of his coming to the earth. But he did what his Father asked. And because he did, he holds all power on earth and in heaven. And as Paul records, has become the author and finisher of our faith. And as many as receive him become his sons and daughters. Now how was it done? It was possible only through sacrifice. Truly, sacrifice does bring forth the blessings of heaven. But how and why it happened seems to be difficult to understand. And perhaps very few people really understand it. Maybe this is the reason that so few people are willing to make the required sacrifice to allow the work of the Lord to fully succeed. 
The prophet Joseph, in his sixth lecture on faith, gives probably the greatest statement which is extant on this vital subject. The prophet said, An actual knowledge to any person that the course of life which he pursues is according to the will of God is essentially necessary to enable him to have that confidence in God without which no person can obtain eternal life. And unless they have an actual knowledge that the course that they are pursuing is according to the will of God, they will grow weary in their minds and faint. It was through sacrifice and this only that God has ordained that men should enjoy eternal life. And it is through the medium of the sacrifice of all earthly things that men do actually know that they are doing the things that are well-pleasing in the sight of God. It is in vain for persons to fancy to themselves that they are heirs with them or can be heirs with them who have offered their all in sacrifice and by this means obtained faith in God and favor with him so as to obtain eternal life unless they in like manner offer unto him the same sacrifice and through that offering obtain the knowledge that they are accepted of him. Those then who make the sacrifice will have the testimony that their course is pleasing in the sight of God. But those who have not made this sacrifice to God do not know that the course which they pursue is well-pleasing in his sight. For whatever may be their belief or their opinion, it is a matter of doubt and uncertainty in their mind. And where doubt and uncertainty are, their faith is not, nor can it be. For doubt and faith do not exist in the same person at the same time. And so that persons whose minds are under doubts and fears cannot have unshaken confidence. And where unshaken confidence is not, their faith is weak. And where faith is weak, the persons will not be able to contend against all the opposition, tribulation, and afflictions which they'll have to encounter in order to be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And they will grow weary in their minds, and the adversary will have power over them and destroy them. From this, it is apparent that sacrifice, no matter how disagreeable it may be, is absolutely vital. For it is the only means by which the Lord has provided for his children to gain the faith and the assurance necessary to successfully return to his presence in condition to enjoy eternal life. Now, what would constitute a sacrifice today? All too often, when we hear the word sacrifice, we think of a burnt offering or one man laying down his life for another, as, of course, was the case with the Master for all of us. These are valid examples, but surely there are some more very modern sacrifices which the Lord has instituted to bless his children today. Some of these might include paying tithing in a day when prices are increasing and in at a very alarming rate, and uh, inflation seems to be rampant. Observing the word of wisdom, when using stimulants of all kinds, is almost a way of life in this nation and in others. Living morally clean and chaste, when these principles are scoffed at by every newsstand and from almost every movie screen. Filling a mission, when serving in the mission field means a break in the educational pursuits of our young men and women. And sometimes it also means early exposure to military service. I interviewed a young 19-year-old, a young man, about service in the mission field just recently. When I suggested that this was the course that the Lord wanted him to take, he said, but Elder Rector, if I did that, I'd have to quit school. I said, yes, that's true. You would have to quit school. But so did the 12 young men that are working, laboring right here in your stake and have brought some of your friends into the church. Holding family home evening might appear as a sacrifice when among the myriads of other distractions, a professional football game competes for prime time on Monday night. Yes, my brothers and sisters, sacrifice is just as integral part of the economy of God today as it ever was. And sacrifice still brings forth the blessings of heaven. Without it, no blessings come forth. 
although serving just to earn a blessing is certainly not right either. The service should be rendered because we love the Lord, and because we love his children. May we serve with an eye single to the glory of God and do what the Lord wants us to do rather than endlessly doing what we want to do. And may we do it because we love the Lord. I am a witness that God lives. I know he lives and that he hears and answers prayers, for he has heard and answered mine. I bear you my testimony that I know that Jesus is the Christ and that he lives. I know he lives that he has reestablished his church upon the earth in our own day and time through the great prophet Joseph Smith, wonderful man that he was, and that we have a prophet of God on earth today, President Joseph Fielding Smith, whom you heard from this morning, and that this is the church and kingdom of God, that the decisions are made by revelation in this church under the direction of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, whose church it really is. And I bear this witness to you in all soberness. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.